And I'm very grateful for all who have gathered here this evening to share with us in this moment of prayer as we witness uh, firsthand the humanitarian catastrophe that is ex being experienced in Syria. And as we reflect upon it this evening, I think we can perhaps do so from a threefold perspective. The very first is that there's a humanitarian catastrophe which has been unfolding in Syria for the past two years. And we save lives only by helping to end the conflict and not fueling it. So in other words, our sisters and brothers in Syria have suffered greatly through these two years of civil war, that it is a catastrophe that has brought great, great desperation among so many. And now we as sisters and brothers who seek to reach out in assistance to these people on that basis are called to try to end the war, to bring it to a conclusion, and not to fuel it, not to make it worse than it is. And so we're very anguished, I think all of us gathered here tonight, by the continued suffering of the Syrian people, that they certainly have endured the experience of very much in these recent years, and our sympathy, our total feeling and outreach to them is one of bringing them peace, of bringing them consolation. And it is very clear by all of us that the use of chemical weapons is particularly abhorrent. And we of the church absolutely condemn their use. And we mourn for the lives of those who have lost in this uh, recent utilization of these weapons. And we really grieve with the families of their deceased. So we are brothers and sisters in the human family, and we truly reach out in a very special way in sympathy, understanding, compassion for all of those who have lost those, some who are so very dear to them. And so along with Pope Francis, we urge the U.S. government now to spare no effort in guaranteeing humanitarian assistance to those wounded by this terrible conflict. And in particular, the many refugees in nearby countries and those who have been displaced internally within Syria. And to this end, Catholic Relief Service is working courageously under very difficult and uh, really, uh, I think, uh, circumstances, dangerous circumstances in neighboring countries to help Syrian refugees. And international Catholic relief agencies under the banner of Caritas Internationalis are providing a range of services from food to medical service and educational programs so that the church is reaching out to need right now, particularly of those who have endured this suffering, those who particularly have been affected by the recent utilization of these chemical weapons. But along with Pope Francis, we strongly believe that dialogue is the only option to put an end to conflict and the suffering of the Syrian people. So we urge our government, the U.S. government, to work with other, other governments to obtain a ceasefire, to initiate serious negotiations, to provide impartial humanitarian assistance, and encourage efforts to build an inclusive society in Syria, in Syria, a secular government that protects the rights of all its citizens, including Christians and other minorities. The only way to a conclusion that will be lasting that will have an impact is one that is achieved through negotiation, is through somehow getting the warring parties together to bring an end to this uh, disaster. And so we know some facts about the war, that more than 100,000 Syrians thus far have lost their lives, that more than 2 million have fled the country as refugees, 1 million of these are children. And more than four million within Syria have been driven from their homes by the violence. Two million of these are children. So we see that what we really have is a humanitarian crisis of terrific proportions that we need to be much aware of within the construct of how we are going to respond to this in a way that brings peace instead of fueling the war to an increased danger. We believe that the Catholics, as we are doing this evening, and all of our friends from other different religions and faiths who are very welcome tonight, should unite in response to Pope Francis's call, which we had today, a prayer of fasting, 
a day of fasting and prayer for peace in, in uh, Syria, the Middle East. We're praying also in a special way for Egypt and the world on this Saturday, September 7th. We must witness ourselves now for peace, that you and I are called to be very strongly to witness the power and the presence of Jesus in the world today. We are the church. What is the church? The church is the body of Christ. And so it is up to you and to me to be that Christ in the world today. We know which side he would be on. We know that he would be on the side of peace, that which really brings love and compassion to all. And so first of all, we're called to witness to the power of prayer, to our hope for peace, and to the knowledge that, as Pope Francis says, all men and women of goodwill are bound by the task of pursuing peace. That is our responsibility, and may we more and more encourage others to join our ranks in that witness to peace. And so the day of prayer and fasting has a special urgency here in the United States as it comes just before Congress will consider military intervention in Syria, and most likely that will be next week. United with Pope Francis, the USCCB Committee on International Justice and Peace have, have issued, along with Cardinal Dolan, a statement asking all U.S. citizens and people of goodwill to join us in witnessing in the hope that we have in our hearts for peace for the Syrian people. And so we hope our prayers, fasting, and advocacy will move our nation to promote a peaceful resolution of this conflict in Syria. And as we are doing here tonight, Dioceses and churches are gathering in this prayer, in some form of prayer, to show their unity and their great desire for peace, which certainly will come through our advocacy, all of our work on behalf of peace. But when Jesus spoke about the person who was afflicted with a certain devil, he said they are only thrown out by prayer and fasting. And so we have from the very pages of our scriptures the call to do what we are doing tonight. That which is most difficult to obtain must be through our own prayer, our fasting, and then out of that, our strong advocacy for what we truly believe to, right, to be right. And I think that we also have to recognize that the situation in Syria is extremely complex and volatile, and a military response will only pour gas on the fire. Instead, we bishops urge Congress to choose dialogue and diplomacy in Syria. And it's not only we bishops, but it is all of you together with one united voice that really insists dialogue and diplomacy be the way of the United States in this particular day and in this particular issue. And so we join with Pope Francis in his appeal to the leaders. We have the just completed G20 nations in which he had urged them to find ways to overcome the conflicting positions and to lay aside the futile pursuit of a military solution. So it is our firm conviction, that is the bishops, but in union with all of you, that violence will only lead to more violence. And so therefore, dialogue and negotiation is the only path forward. We always seem to rely on a military intervention on bombs and destruction and death instead. We strongly feel that a military attack would, first of all, be counterproductive. Secondly, would exacerbate an already catastrophic and volatile situation. And thirdly, would have negative unintended consequences, including the potential for violence to spire out of control throughout the region. Specifically, military intervention would only distract from and delay efforts toward a diplomatic resolution of this conflict. Secondly, would lack either a domestic or international consensus of support. We know that thus far, at least in the information that I have been reading in the papers, is that 60% of the American people at this time are opposed to a military intervention in Syria. So we must listen to the people, to their wisdom, to their experience, to what is speaking from their hearts. And it would not prevent the future use of chemical weapons either in Syria or elsewhere. The situation is too unstable. And so this is not a, a matter of prevention. And so it would not really address the heart of the question as to how we are really going to bring about a situation 
where we can abandon the sense of the loss of life. Could dangerously escalate the conflict both within, within Syria and within the region. We know how volatile some of the relationships are in the Middle East, and this the utilization of these weapons has the potential of escalating those possibilities and would lead to a worsening of the humanitarian catastrophe already taking place. We know that in what they antiseptically call the fact that there will be collateral damage, what that really means, more deaths, what that really means is innocent suffering significantly, what that means is that there is more destruction and the fueling of hate and resentment in the hearts of ever so many. A U.S. military, military attack will lead to more death and destruction on the ground. We must keep the welfare of the Syrian people at the forefront of the debate. Our foremost goal must be peace for the Syrian people. And we know that all of our counterparts, our bishops and others who are in the venerable churches of the Middle East have absolutely said, do not utilize military weapons. It will only make the situation which we are experiencing worse. And they are extraordinarily clear in their language and their direction. They're right there. They know forsake what is good for them and for their people. And so we applaud the restraint that has been shown by the administration to date and the decision to seek congressional approval. And as John Paul II has said so very beautifully, war is a defeat for humanity. And quite simply what he means is that it is the fact that we have not utilized the beautiful gifts that God has given to us as his sons and daughters to somehow live fully his life in the world today. So we move tonight in our prayer, and we know that peace is very much in the hearts of the majority of the American people, and in that, for that matter, even more so in the hearts of the world's people, that they do not believe that such an action is really in the very best interest of humanity, of all of us around the world. We need to remember Iraq. I had the privilege of going to Iraq in the spring of this year, for the installation of the new Chaldean Patriarch in Iraq. And as I went and met the Iraqi people in general, they were very kind and welcoming and pleasant, but they were very straightforward as they looked me in the eye and said, you know, Bishop, the American people have ruined our country. And what, he, what they meant simply by that is that the American strategy was to take out all security, particularly national security, of armies and protection, et cetera, and then moved into even the local security. So that today, essentially, there is very little trustworthy security abroad. We see that this is the situation that has evolved, that we have to be aware of history. We have to want, oftentimes see that an intervention has a far worse effect than sometimes doing nothing at all. And so we come as a people, first of all, we look at the facts, we look at our understanding, we say, what is the wisest thing to do in the interest of the people themselves? How do we say that the people have to be punished? How about those who had a dead brother? And saying the way to punish them now is to kill more of your brothers through the utilization of military means. It seems to lack a certain logic that this is the way to go and to achieve the ends of punishing perhaps a dictator we do not justify what he did in any way, but how are we to respond? Is now that the uh, nations of the world are very attentive to this, to really insist to work urgently and tirelessly for peace, to get people together, to push hard, say it's not impossible, it is something that we can do because we deeply believe in the human spirit and the fact that we are all sisters and brothers in the one human family. As we come together, we recognize that prayer can be effective, that prayer can be very powerful, that it can, in a certain way, impl implore God to enable this situation to be changed, but it also changes us. It changes us because it opens us to the call that we are to absorb the very powerful peace and presence of Jesus in our own lives. And as I said earlier, that we are the presence of Jesus in the world today, and that through our prayer, we are constantly transformed into his ways, into his love, 
into his sense of peace. And in that manner, we become advocates of peace. We are courageous in the face of what seemingly others would tout as what is important to, to do. But we now, I think, within the American people have a, almost a consensus that this is the way to go. But we must be strong in our advocacy. We must be consistent in our advocacy. We must always be loving in our advocacy and that the means that we undertake are proportionate to the end and the goal that we truly want to achieve. So I thank you for being with us tonight, that we come for this moment of prayer. We come out of a deep, deep love for the Syrian people. We come to say that change is possible. Peace is possible. It is possible through our insistence that it occur. And we as Americans have a great, great deal to say about it because of all that has been provided for us, all of the wealth, all of the other possibilities in our lives that we have experienced and that we are called now to be a nation at the service of peace.